Good morning, Victoria Park Baptist Church. Um, it's again such an honour to come and be able to share with you this morning. Uh, I hope and pray that all of you are well um, and happy Mother's Day to um, all of you mothers. And um, yeah, we thank God for all of you mums and women who do so much to support others within the church and within your families and the wider world. Um, happy Mother's Day. I really hope that you've been able to, to do something lovely to celebrate today, despite the restrictions. Um, thank you for having me back again. For those of you who um, don't remember me, then my name's Helen Fernandez, and I'm the minister of Royal Docks Community Church, which is a church in the south of Newham in the Royal Docks by City Airport and the XL. So um, it's really lovely to be able to come and share with you today even at this kind of strange time in this strange format and um, I guess I've been reflecting a lot as we're coming up to the year of being in some kind of Covid restriction and lockdown aren't we I've been reflecting a lot on what this past year has taught me and um, what things I've missed what things I'm lamenting and I'm uh, fighting to to see again I guess and to change in the future um, and also what things I've actually really learned and loved. And one thing that I've noticed is um, I've actually really liked being forced to spend more time outdoors. I don't know if this is your story at all, um, but I grew up in the countryside and I'm a really big outdoorsy kind of person. And city life doesn't always lend itself to that type of lifestyle. Um, and especially in winter, it's not something that we tend to make an effort to do, is it? To get outside. Um, but here we are in 2021, just having had the coldest and darkest months of the year. And rather than what I would normally do is meeting friends and family in our homes, um, you know, having a cup of tea, sharing dinner together. Instead, I've found myself walking around my neighbourhood more times than I want to count. Prayer walking, catching up with people or even just by myself as some form of um, sanity. And I, I've spent so much more time outdoors than I realised. Um, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's always been great. In fact, I was uh, writing this talk, sat in my car, uh, because I planned to go out for a walk and it started tipping it down with rain and was really windy and there's nowhere to just go, oh, I'll just go and sit in a coffee shop. So I just sat in the, the driver's seat of my car writing this talk. So it's not always ideal. Um, but I think it's done me a world of good um, giving my soul a chance to connect with God more, giving me a chance to be closer to nature. And I think it's also actually helped me to read the Bible in a new way. Um, I try and spend a bit of time listening to the Bible as I walk around outdoors. And as I hear the stories of Jesus' ministry, I've realised that so many of those were outdoors. And the way that we do church within our four walls is a, a lot less... Um, or maybe a lot more polished than how um, Jesus's talks would have been given, interrupted by the elements in the beauty of nature and away from the man-made things we've built up. In fact, I was hoping to record this talk outside, but it is still tipping it down with rain and I'm not up for that. <laughs> um, but today we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000, which is one of those stories, those great moments that happens outdoors in the wilderness, away from other things. And for me, it's really come alive reading it in the context of where I, our lives are at at the moment. And as I read it now, I encourage you, um, if you want to, to, to read along. But actually, I think um, I would actually like to encourage you just to shut your eyes. Imagine yourself there. What do you see? What do you hear? What does it feel like? What's the weather like? What's this huge, miraculous outdoor picnic like to be at? And I'm going to read the account from uh, John. It's John chapter 6. And I'll start at verse 1. So as I read it, please just um, be there. Enter into this story with me. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. 
Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people come in to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now in John's Gospel, this story happens immediately after Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And he gets into this theological debate just before this with the Pharisees. He and his disciples cross over the Sea of Galilee, which is essentially a really large lake. Um, and they sit down together on top of this hill. Must have felt like a bit of a sigh of relief. The crowds have been following them, loving these signs, wanting to see more of Jesus. Ah, <sighs> Time to sit be together, be in the wilderness. I wonder how that bit of the story felt as I read it. But wrong. Not time to be alone together because here comes the crowd. They've heard about the miracles that Jesus performs. They want to see it for themselves. And Jesus asks the disciples, doesn't he, where they can find food? But he knows the answer. Nowhere. <laughs> There's nowhere nearby for them to go. And even if they could go there, there's literally thousands of people. They don't have the money. So one of the disciples notices a young boy with loaves and fish. A packed lunch. A first century happy meal. He points it out to Jesus. And he's kind of doubtful, isn't he, of what good it will do. But that's all that Jesus needs. He blesses it and there is enough for everyone. I love picturing how on earth the disciples coordinated thousands of people to all sit down together on the side of the hill, how they managed to get food round to them all, how they managed to gather up all of those leftovers. What an amazing operation. But that's not the main point John wants to make here, is it? There's something lovely where Jesus took what Andrew had noticed. And even though Andrew was sceptical, he managed to multiply that into enough to satisfy thousands and when that boy and when the disciples offered what they had to Jesus Jesus did amazing things with it and the same is still true for us today isn't it when we give Jesus what we have even when we're doubtful of what good it will do Jesus can use it for wonderful things sometimes all we have to do is take that chance offer those things to Jesus and he'll do the rest of it. I've been part of a community meeting for contemplative prayer in the mornings on Facebook Live. And we've been challenged to do one thing each day, which we wouldn't do if we weren't followers of Jesus. That's really challenged me. And for me, I've noticed that often that one thing is to take a chance on something where otherwise I might play it safe. Allowing my day to be interrupted by stopping and talking to someone when I was in a rush to get somewhere or being brave enough to make a point to someone which ordinarily I'd have just kept as a thought. Asking Jesus to help me notice the things in my day and bringing those things to him because when we bring Jesus the little that we have he can do wonders with it. Now this is a story, isn't it, that many of us know well and we love. And I wonder if when you heard it, it was different to what you expected. 
It certainly was for me, because John tells this story quite differently to the other gospel writers. He misses out some details and he adds in others. I really noticed some words missing. All three of the other gospel writers include this in their gospels and they all write Jesus say in the words, you feed them. But John doesn't talk about that. John's ultimate point isn't really about us. It's really about who Jesus is. You see, John's gospel contains far less miracles than the other gospels, but each of them carries a huge amount of weight for him. He has seven signs throughout his gospel and each of them for him, re really they are signs. They are pointing to something about who Jesus is and what he is doing in the world, what he is doing for God's kingdom. They're not just miracles that show that he's powerful and loving. There's a reason behind all of them. So there's a real reason why John's included this um, story and a real reason why he's uh, made the points that he has made about it and told the story slightly differently. So what does John want us to learn from this sign? Let's remind ourselves what this story is. It's a miraculous meal in the wilderness. It's a meal where God provided when there was no other way. It's a meal where bread from heaven fills the bellies of the Israelites. Does that sound familiar to you? In case it's not sounding familiar, John continues with this story. Straight after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walks on water. Again, John doesn't, John doesn't make the point uh, that the other gospel writers make. We don't hear about Peter walking on the water and falling. We just hear about the disciples being afraid. Jesus calling out, don't be afraid, I am here. I am. The words that Jews didn't say themselves, about themselves, the words that Jews saved for their God, the I am. And as often happens in John's gospel, there's a little clue at the start of John 6, which helps us to understand where John is trying to get us to. John just mentions it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Passover was the time when the Israelites remember the Exodus. They remember when they were led by their prophet Moses, when they were led out of captivity, when they were led miraculously through a body of water through the Red Sea, and miraculously they were fed with bread from heaven. To John, this is a sign of the new Exodus to come. Did you notice the crowd talking about the prophet that they'd been expecting after they ate this miraculous bread? The prophet Jesus, the Messiah Jesus, is here to lead his people out of captivity and to feed them in the wilderness. But John's story still isn't done. It continues the next day as the crowd on the other side of the lake realised that only the disciples got into the boat when it left but Jesus was with, with them when they land how did he get there this causes a stir and Jesus replies to the crowd this is uh, in verse 26 now Jesus replies I tell you the truth you want to be with me because I fed you not because you understood understood the miraculous signs but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What a beautiful phrase. He gives life to the world. 
Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The crowd start asking Jesus for a sign in this, don't they? They remind him of their ancestors' journey, their manner in the wilderness. And I find that quite ironic, given that he's just fed them miraculously in the wilderness. But they're so busy, aren't they, being caught up in what Jesus can do, the miracles and the wonders. They forget that these are all signs pointing to something much bigger. Jesus points out that it wasn't Moses. It was never Moses that provided the manna. It was God. And the real work of God wasn't filling their bellies. It was journeying with the Israelites through the wilderness into the promised land. And this is true for the crowd that Jesus is talking to as well. The real work of God isn't Jesus filling their bellies, but it's an invitation to be nourished by him, to be nourished by the true bread of heaven. And what's the thing they need to do? Well, Moses was given the Ten Commandments. He was given hundreds of other laws for the Israelites to follow. But what do they have to do to be part of God's people now in this new exodus? Jesus spells it out. He says, believe in me. Believe in Jesus. Not a set of a hundred new rules. Believe in Jesus. No need to avoid clothes with different fabrics. No need to avoid shellfish. No need to ceremonially wash after shaking hands with a woman who's on her period. Just believe in Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Sometimes we overcomplicate our faith and what we need to do, but it's that simple. Keep coming back to Jesus. Not just when you need a miracle, but in your daily life, with everything you have, feeding on the word of God, the bread of life, allowing him to nourish and shape you. You won't be hungry. You won't be thirsty. He will satisfy your soul. I wonder, are you looking for miracles to which make great stories? Or are you looking for a daily relationship feeding on the bread of life? Are you looking for a God to fill your belly or a God to nourish your soul? I really remember this notion from when I was a teenager, kind of going to Christian festivals and youth worship meetings and loving the buzz of it, coming away on a spiritual high because we'd heard amazing stories and seen amazing things. And in the few weeks after, gradually that wearing off as normal life crept back in. Spiritual highs are amazing things, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we become set on the extraordinary once in a blue moon that we miss out on the everyday. And maybe some of us have found Sundays like that, especially over this past year we might have noticed it. Maybe the Sunday gatherings of our churches were spiritual highs where Jesus filled our bellies and we, we came back again the week after for another bit of pizzazz. I don't know, I found that a huge challenge this year. And my church is not a showy one. I know yours isn't either. But where is God when the buzz of our Sunday gatherings is gone? Or where the joy of the children running around eating all the biscuits is gone? Or when the feeling when we sing together is gone? Or the comfort of having someone lay their hand on you in prayer is gone? Where is God? Still here. The bread of life, inviting us to believe in him, to come to him, saying that he will nourish us. So what can you do to be more grounded in Jesus, to feed on him more? Maybe it's about having consistent people that we can be honest and pray with. Maybe it's about time alone with God ourselves. Or maybe it's wise choices about how we spend our days and how we see Jesus in our ordinary lives, making those ordinary lives kingdom focused. 
I encourage you to spend a bit of time reflecting now about how God has nourished you this year, how you've experienced a bread of life even throughout Covid and what nourishment you need from God for the months ahead. Let's pray. Jesus, the bread of life, we come to you now. We believe in you. We come to you and ask that we will never be hungry. We come to you and ask that we will never be thirsty. Jesus, will you nourish our dry and cracked souls? And will you lead us into living a full life of worship with you? Amen. <laughs>